entitled Pearls and Pitfalls, Tales from the Lab. My name is Chris Gilpin from Global TV Program of the World Health Organization in Geneva. And my co-chair is Rita Delolo from Zimbabwe with, with the Union. So we're interested in listening to these presentations today. We have a smaller number of, of presentations, so each presenter will be allowed some extra time to, to share your work. So what we will do is allow up to 10 minutes for each presenter, but uh, we would like to be able to ask each presenter uh, at least a couple of questions. So I'd first like to invite Andrew Stinhoff um, from the United States to present on the prevalence and risk factors for gastric aspirate sample contamination in pediatric TB suspects in Botswana. Andrew. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Thank you to the organisers for uh, inviting me to present on behalf of the group. Um, I'll ask the chairs just to give me a six-minute warning or something like that. I'm going to speak about the prevalence and risk factors for gastric aspirate sample contamination in pediatric TB suspects in Botswana. So by way of background, we know that TB is a leading and neglected cause of childhood mortality globally. The numbers are coming out more and more, giving us data to support this. We also know that as pediatricians or people working in pediatric TB, whether we're nurses or doctors, that it's challenging to diagnose TB in children for a number of reasons, and I've summarized them there. Uh, children have a non-specific clinical presentation. Uh, they also have porcy bacillary, so low numbers of bacteria. Uh, compared to adults, which makes the smear uh, a very poor test. And young children can't easily cough up sputum. You can't go up to a two-year-old and say, please cough here. Uh, you have to somehow get the sample out uh, from them. We also know that some of the rapid molecular diagnostic tests, such as EXPERT, uh, are not as good in, in children, 76% sensitivity at best. And so TB culture remains a useful test uh, where it's available to diagnose TB in children. So our group, uh, starting in 2008, worked with the Botswana National TB Program, uh, and we worked with clinicians around the country of Botswana, where we trained people to use gastric aspirates to collect sputum from children who were suspected of having tuberculosis. And what we did is that sputum was then sent uh, for culture testing. And that was sent to the single national TB lab, which is uh, located in Khabarone, which is the capital of Botswana. Um, what we noticed as clinicians and as people running the project is that there seemed to be a rather high contamination rate. And so the aim of this project was to assess that formally, and I'm going to report here to you today uh, the prevalence and the risk factors for uh, gastric aspirate sample contamination. What were our methods? Well, I'll show you a picture there of Botswana just, and one of France, just to give you a sense of size. Botswana is the same size as France or Texas, and it's got 2.1 million people located in it. The red dot is where the lab is located in Khabarone, just to give you a sense that some of the samples were traveling over 1,000 kilometers uh, to reach uh, the national lab. So we analyzed uh, samples from 2010 to 2014 uh, using routine uh, electronic data from the National TB Lab. We actually limited our analysis and what I'm going to present to you to the first sample received, even though some children had two and occasionally three samples. Uh, and we actually excluded the small number of samples that were collected from private practitioners, and we also excluded those that were taken from children who were on treatment. <laughs> And then you can see we evaluated crude associations with contamination, uh, looking at the, the variables that I've listed. So some demographic variables, some distance variables, how far was uh, the site to the lab, um, and, uh, and you can see the stats that we used there as well. We also tried to think about this uh, in as honest a way epidemiologically as we could, we drew up causal diagrams around the data points that we had, and we explored factors uh, using these diagrams. And we used logistic regression and we used GEE um, to assess. So what did we find? 
and you know, I've circled in red uh, the area that I want to highlight. Um, so you can see there were 4,200 pretty much first gastric aspirate samples. In our study we included just over 3,500 and disappointingly we, we found 36%, so over a third of samples uh, were contaminated. Uh, and you can see that 1,250 were contaminated of those, uh, and there were an additional 54 that were positive for AFB on smear, but were also contaminated. But this was a very disappointing result, and so our clinical suspicion that there was a lot of contamination going on was, was unfortunately very true. So given the shortness of this presentation, I'm just cutting right down to uh, the multivariable results. Um, and uh, this is a multivariable model of the factors that were associated with gastric aspirate sample contamination. So we looked at sex, we looked at age, we looked at distance from the hospital, etc., etc. But you can see that there were basically two uh, items in the multivariable model that came out as being significantly um, associated uh, with, with sample contamination. So the first one uh, I showed in reverse here is that if a sample came from a referral or district uh, or primary hospital, there was a protection against being contaminated. So obviously the flip side is true, that if a sample came from a clinic or a health post in Botswana, there was a, an increased risk of, uh, of contamination. So the smaller the facility, the higher the risk. And you can see the two groups that we looked at there. And then the second significant factor that was associated with contamination was uh, there were two different uh, culture media that were used, and this was just uh, what was happening in Botswana's national lab. Historically, solid media, Lowenstein Jensen had been used, and uh, about halfway through the study period, the lab changed over to use liquid culture media, so midget. And with that, we actually saw an increase, uh, as you can see, an 88% increase um, as well. So two factors, smaller health facility and change to uh, liquid media. So my final slide, um, as you can see from our operational research project in Botswana, there is indeed a significant problem with gastric aspirate sample contamination in, in, in this project, with over a third of samples uh, being uh, contaminated. And as a clinician, this, this really was a problem for us uh, and really limited our yield of culture uh, in, uh, in, in TB suspects. I'm not reporting here what our culture yield was, but that was also relatively low. As you saw in the last slide, what were the risk factors associated with contamination of gastric aspirate samples in children? They were two, liquid-based media and samples from smaller sites, so clinics and health posts. Um, one might ask, at least in the Botswana setting, um, why was this? Was it sample collection technique? Uh, was it because the child wasn't fasting, because the children came in early in the morning, they didn't stay overnight, these were health posts or clinics? Was it the refrigeration that wasn't that great? Um, and one might even ask, if, from a public health standpoint, should we say, if one's working at the Botswana National TB Lab, that if one's going to do gastric aspirates, that these are only done at slightly higher level facilities, so the bigger hospitals, for example, and they should not be done at health posts and clinics. And then lastly, the last point is that the low culture yield and delays uh, with central TB lab testing really emphasize what we're all dreaming for in adult and pediatric TB, uh, the key role of future decentralized uh, culture diagnostics. So expert obviously hasn't given us the solution yet in pediatrics, uh, but it would be nice in the future if we had a, a facility-based test uh, that could get diagnosed TB uh, accurately in children. So I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues from Botswana UPenn Partnership, from the Botswana National TB Reference Lab, Bontlem Bear, and from the University of Botswana, Francis Bunder. And I'm happy to take questions if time allows. Yes, so. Yeah, thanks Andrew for presenting those challenges. Diagnosing TB in children is always uh, challenge. Mm. But um, you, you indicate that um, you were, were using culture, you were losing a third of your samples through contamination, so was it a, a centralised, one centralised culture facility that we're going to? But equally you could be doing expert at the central level and you know, we 
which is going to be much less affected by uh, you know, delays in sample transport. Yeah. But uh, any questions from the audience? Yes. <coughs> yes, could you uh, introduce yourself and uh, ask your question? Thanks. My name is Albert, coming from Kenya. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question goes to the fact that uh, in your analysis of your contamination, uh, in your contamination uh, variables, you seem to concentrate on the patient rather than concentrating on the lab. So what are some of the laboratory variables that could have contributed to the contamination apart from the patient? Because then we would know the contamination is not from the patients, but rather it's inherent in the lab. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that's a great comment, really important. Obviously, I think successful culture uh, is based on many different things, right from the time of the sample being taken uh, from the patient all the way through getting the sample to the lab and then what happens within the lab itself. This was a retrospective uh, analysis, so we had to just use what data we had. Um, and so, as you can see on this table, we, we really were only able to look at transport time. Uh, one of the challenges that we face in the Botswana setting is the capacity in the lab sometimes uh, is outstripped by the number of samples that are coming in. So um, it would have been useful also to see what was the time from when, for example, a sample arrived at the lab to when it was actually analyzed. So I, I, I think that needs to be looked at in the future. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the audience? Whilst you may formulate a, formulate a question, may I ask you, Andrew, just for comparison, what's the con contamination rate of the adult sputum culture specimens in this lab in the same time period? Yeah, no, it is a good question. Um, and it's a lot less. Uh, I don't know the number accurately, but it's probably, I don't know, 10 to 15 percent, something of that nature. So this is, uh, you know, way out uh, of, uh, of kilt uh, in terms of, uh, of the rest of the samples. Uh, it's an important comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. Andrew. If we could move on to our second presentation, Ajay from Ajay Pudel from Nepal, who will be presenting on predominance of modern lineage of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Beijing genotype among clinical isolates in Nepal. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, I'm going to present. Uh, about the modern sublineage of mycobacterium tuberculosis prevalent in Nepal. Okay. This is the current scenario of the uh, TB in Nepal. Uh, tuberculosis is one of the major public health problem in Nepal. And uh, so the prevalence of all the form of TB uh, in Nepal is 211 per 100,000 population. And incidence of the TB is 156 per 100,000 population, and death is 17 per 100,000 population. And the MDR and uh, XDR rate are also high. Uh, among new cases, the MDR TB is 2.2 percent, and among retreatment cases, 15.4 percent. And uh, XDR the uh, cases among MDR TB is 8 percent. This slide uh, shows the uh, different lineage of the mycobacterium tuberculosis and their distribution in different countries. Uh, there are six lineages of mycobacterium tuberculosis, and we can see the as shown in the slide here. Uh, you can see the different lineages, like lineage two, blue color, is distributed in Asian country mainly East Asian country and South Africa and some places in the Russia. R Russia. And while as the lineage 4 uh, is distributed uh, in the uh, Americas and the, this Africa and European countries. So different countries have the different lineages. So this is uh, based upon the last sequence polymorphism of the mycobacterium tuberculosis, this classification. So I'm going to talk about the mycobacterium Beijing family, 
which uh, which is preva uh, prevalent in the east asian countries and now emerging worldwide and this uh, this beijing family is particularly of interest to the uh, uh, to the clinicians or the to the researcher also because they are associated with the drug resistance and they are highly virulent than other uh, lineages and they is, can escape the bcg vaccination so the prevention of the tb due to the beijing family is very uh, difficult challenging and uh, this beijing family can also classified into two sub families or sub lineages modern and ancient and the modern is all wide prevalent but the ancient have been detected in Uh, Japan and Korea, and the Beijing strain of the modern sublineage possesses the IS six one one zero insertion in the noise transfer function region, but that is absent in the ancient. Uh, in this study, I use the multi locus sequence typing to uh, to classify the Beijing family based upon the single nucleotide polymorphism SNPs. and there are uh, 10 loci uh, used all wide for the classification of the beijing sub uh, beijing lineage into the different sub lineage 10 loci and this loci can uh, classify the beijing into modern and ancient and within modern also different sub types and within ancient also different sub types that is the classification and classification more classification and here i selected the this loci and which is very useful to classify only the modern and ancient but for further classification to identify the st uh, st sequence type we we have to use the other loci but in this study i am going to present only this loci so if the modern lineage have the t and the ancient lineage in the c in this allele Uh, in the mycobacterium tuberculosis so there is uh, this kind of snips uh, we can use for the classification of uh, beijing family so the objective of this study is to determine the prevalence uh, of the different sub lineage of mycobacterium beijing family among clinical isolates in nepal methodology uh, we collected the sputum sample from uh, suspected tb cases and uh, perform the uh, drug sensitivity test after the microscopy drug sensitivity test and uh, so there were 601 mdr isolates and we extracted the dna from the mdr isolates and uh, and classify by the spo oligotyping to uh, understand the prevalent genotype and this is the uh, this is the pattern of the beijing family in the spo oligotyping and when uh, the beijing were isolated then we further proceed with the snps identification by the multi locus sequence typing so based upon the uh, spo oligotyping the pre uh, this slide show the prevalence of the mycobacterium tuberculosis lineage among the mdr isolated in nepal and here in nepal also the beijing is most prevalent the uh, the most uh, the prevalent one is the beijing around 50% of the mdr isolates 15 50% of 601 were the beijing beijing lineage and followed by the east african indian and other lineage euro american and the in, uh, indo oceanic lineage it was around 6% so uh, the beijing and based upon the multi locus sequence typing the in our uh, samples the modern the modern beijing which is green one was 82% so the this was the most prevalent one and the ancient we detected only 18% of the uh, beijing isolates so uh, in summary the multi locus sequence typing classified 82% of the mdr beijing strain into the modern sub lineage and in our previous study which was earlier published uh, among xtr isolates also the modern sub lineage was prevalent and uh, the controlling the spread of the strain of the more modern sub lineage is very important because there are various study from different countries reported that modern sub lineage is more virulent 
and the transmission uh, transmission pattern of the modem is very high the transmissibility is very high so the the interest is the modern sublinear and uh, analyzing as i already mentioned analyzing the additional loci can help to further classify modern lineage into the different subtypes okay so this is the final slide uh, so i i acknowledge uh, german uh, the people in german nepal t uh, tv project giant of nepal dr bhagwan sesta uh, sesta and uh, bhavana sesta and the bhagwan maharjan and uh, who provided me the samples the clinical isolates and uh, the molecular part genetic part i uh, i perform in the hokkaido university research center for genomic control japan and i acknowledge professor asuki suzuki and dr c nakajima for their guidance thank you very much thank you very much uh, ajay for your presentation which is now open for questions Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Apologies if I missed this, but how do your results compare to other countries in in the region? Is this what you expected to find in terms of the amount of the Beijing strain? Yeah, as I already mentioned that the modern sublineage of the Beijing is prevalent in the Asian country. And uh, there are some report from Thailand and Taiwan and also Peru. Uh, so they have reported that the modern lineage is prevalent in those these countries so i was expecting that uh, since in my isolates more uh, beijing was highly prevalent so uh, i was expecting that the, it could can be the modern type and so i got <laughs> the similar result still on on the same sort of theme okay. uh, your study was done in 2013 did i understand you right the uh, samples oh is it 2013 uh, 2013 2013 all right do you have any information about the time trends has a similar study been done any at any stage before this in nepal have you done it yeah before and after more recent years yeah before there was no any study and after also uh, i th in uh, i think there is there is no any study uh, i'm sure you would yeah. know about it yes and in in our case I, we wanted to further classify into different subtypes with the same isolate but it was not for so uh, i didn't fully see um, the subtypes in the modern beijing and the ancient beijing so using your mlst are you able to get a range of different subtypes and uh, and how how many would they be in order to use for you know molecular epidemiological person uh -huh. uh, purposes mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> uh there are uh, i use only one loci and that classify only modern and the ancient and uh that the modern was s subtype stain the prevalent is subtype stains so can i go to the previous slide or no? uh, okay uh, do you have yeah this is the subtype stain with the t uh, mutis uh, this one change was the the modern types so i i check only one loci okay. thank you very much ajay thank, thank you, you. then ask uh, the presenter for the third paper uh, is it dr barreda pons uh, from or anybody from this group either peru united kingdom or usa all right thank you so let's have the slides please good afternoon Uh, I'll be sharing important information on a uh, simple methods of controlling contamination of culture, seven uh, H eleven culture, uh, using a uh, common antifungal agent, which is carbendazine. 
the background is that we know that we have um, molecular diagnosis and genotypic tests for detecting mycobacterium tuberculosis, but also the contamination of mycobacterium tuberculosis is still be a problem. So also it compromised the detection of MTB. In addition, the carbendazine have advantages. Um, one of this is that, for example, it's a real world accessible and also it's inexpensive because one dollar of uh, carbendazine will be used to treat uh, 2,500 plates, uh, 7H11 plates. So the other point is that it uh, has a better antifungal activity than amphotericin B. And prior studies show that the use of the combination of amphotericin B and carbendazine will reduce the contamination in 10%. This study was performed in Malawi. And also, it's a potent antimitotic to reduce all the contamination. The hypothesis is the addition of carbendazine to 7H11 media will, we, will reduce contamination without affecting the growth characteristic of, of mycobacterium tuberculosis. About methods, we evaluate 70 sputum samples from patients with pulmonary TB for a clinical trial in Lima. And all the samples, we process it with NALC standard decontamination. And also, we took two aliquots of 200 microliters, and one of these was inoculated in the 7H11 plate without carbendazine as reference, and the other 200 microliters was inoculated in a plate with carbendazine. Both of that plates were with amphotericin B. So for the result, we, for positive mycobacterium tuberculosis, we evaluate, the, we record the numbers of colonies by physical appearance and by eyes by training biologists. And also, for we consider a negative culture if no growth was observed after eight weeks. For contaminated cultures, if we notice uh, aggressive growth of filamentous fungi or yeast that inhibited the growth of mycobacterium tuberculosis. In the table one, we show that 70 sample cultures. Okay, we, we notice that 10% of the 7H11 plates without carbendazine were contaminated, and also seven of that cultures were negative in the plates with carbendazine and also there was no contamination in the place using carbendazine. And the other point is that we, the, the median colony forming units were um, compared across both groups with and without, uh, without and with carbendazine. And we found that there was a statistical difference between groups. All of these were analyzed by Fisher and Wilkinson tests. Our results suggest that carbendazine could be an effective method for contamination, for reducing contamination in solid media, and also there are no evidence that the that the growth of uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis will be affected with the add of carbendazine. Uh, and a simple is an a simple and expensive method for cont contamination control in clinical laboratory settings. And the next step will be that further studies for a speci for a specific microorganisms that respond to carbendazine. Our conclusion is that carbendazine could be used to perform characteristics of mycobacterium tuberculosis in 7H11 cultures in diagnosis and treatment response. Monitoring. 
this is all the acknowledgement. Um, thank you. And if you have so any question, let me know. Okay, thanks for that presentation. Do we have any questions from the floor? Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, is if you have been able to check if uh, there will be growth of other mycobacteria, not only mycobacterium tuberculosis, but the other one. A typical, there will not be inhibition? Just, there was no evaluate another uh, mycobacterium, just uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So oh, there are no notice uh, a typical mycobacterial in our analysis. other uh, bacterial contamination and you d didn't see any other contamination associated with just normal respiratory bacteria? Yeah, it could be negative gram-negative neg uh, gram or positive gram uh, bacterial. It was with uh, fungi and yeast, all of this. Okay, so you, you even saw a reduction in gram-negative... Um we, don't, we didn't identify the species of each bacteria or fungi, but also could be included in the next studies. Okay, thank you. So, any more questions? All right, thank you then. Thank you. So, if we can move on to the, the next presentation. I think it might be Albert. Um, Okumu from Kenya, if we can have those slides um, up please. And Albert will be presenting on prevalent non-tuberculous mycobacteria species among presumptive MDRTB patients from peripheral health facilities referred to the um, Kenyan uh, Kemri TB laboratory in Kasumu. Please, Albert. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, and thank you to the um, union for giving us opportunity to share our findings for this study. My name is, as has been mentioned, we conducted um, a cross-sectional study to find why uh, do our patients not, f uh, you know, get better when they get treatment. Uh, these patients who are suspected to be having MDRTB. Um, and, and that's what I want to present uh, just now. So for those who don't know where Kenya is, it's in the eastern part of Africa. Um, and, and the place where the study is done is right in the box, as you can see. Um, little is known about the relative burden of non-tuberculous microbacterium. And for that reason, many people present with similar situations as TB and they'll be, they'll be tested with a normal routine microscopical test that we have and they'll be positive and they'll be put onto treatment for TB, not knowing that they really do not have TB. And this non-tuberculous microbacteria, we see that they also share common properties just like the normal TB. So if you do uh, ZN, there will be a positive slide and you'll want to put patients on treatment even if they're not. And also, it's important to know, to have a definitive identification of microbacterium species that you have. And to do this, you need cultures which take several days to weeks, possibly to months before you're able to really say for sure that somebody's having TB. And also, we do not really know for sure by the time we're doing the study, what was the prevalence of NTM in our country. So then this would be an eye opener, just trying to uh, bring this information to the fore. Um, this is just but to describe what these NTMs are, and we you know, know that uh, uh, they are environmental mycobacterium, which are commonly present in the soil, in the environment, in the water, every, everywhere that uh, we can access. And we know that WHO has you know, authorized the expert to be used and primarily and readily to detect TB in certain cases that we would not necessarily get some 
good results with TB, but experts will not provide uh, the identification of NTMs. So that then will be a challenge. And, and, and we treated our MDR patients um, or uh, suspects as people who were retired after default kind of patients, treatment failures, and, and all those categories that WHO classifies as MDR-TB patients. Then why do we, did we do this study? Uh, clinicians were coming to us as the lab people that we have put this patient on treatment for two months or three months. They are not responding. What could they be suffering from? We've done microscopy in our facilities but they are positive and you're telling us they don't have to, what do they have? So then that informed our need uh, to do this, uh, find out really what are these causing uh, clinicians worry and our patients also worry. Um, and, 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 and for that reason, uh, it's also important to know what are some of the challenges that NTMs would cause to our people um, ordinarily and they'll, they'll manifest in various forms. And, 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 and we find out that NTMs, when they infect individuals who are immunocompromised, there are potential challenges as well that come in. And the various types of patients that are, are having um, HIV and AIDS or other debilitating diseases will really suffer certain uh, disease situations that may not be uh, so a good prognosis may not be realized from them. So we did a cross-sectional study um, and we got sputum samples from these presumptive uh, patients across the referral facilities that were sending samples to our lab. Our lab happens to be the second referral facility in the whole country. We only had, we, 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 we Previously, we only had one, which was the central reference lab, which was based in Nairobi. But the Kemri one is in the western part of the country, which now serves about 17 counties. Kenya is divided into counties, about 47. And um, 17 of those 47 happens to be in the western part. And it is in the western part that TB is high. So, the, so these patients uh, were you know, going to their facilities and specimens were being sent using the normal standard transportation uh, procedures uh, when they get to the lab. We had a total of 4,952 uh, 4, patients overall uh, uh, that we had their specimens tested. And out of those, then 280 tested to be having possible having NTMs, and those are the ones that we delved into. The methods that we used were the normal standard culture procedures, the midgets, or LJ, LJs, and the you know, microscopy, because we knew the facilities were also doing microscopy, and expert, as well as the line proboscis, which we wanted now to really distinguish which type of these NTMs do we really have. So um, that just takes us through the, the stepwise procedures that we did uh, in the methodology, how the specimens were coming in, they were first subjected to cultures, and then we did smears. Cultures and smear were done simultaneously, and then experts were done to those that smears were turning positive, and LPS were done to those that uh, smears were also turning positives. Uh, because we all know that some t in, in resource limited settings, you don't just put everybody um, on, on tests. Uh, in um, results, we had about 143 women, representing a percentage of about 51, and 80, 35%, uh, 35.4% were HIV negative, and the rest were HIV positive, with an age median of 36. Um, among the HIV uh, negative individuals, we found that uh, 25 of them uh, had positive TB identification via help EA, uh, via expert, which were uh, were not identified by the culture, um, and, and 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 the microscopy also identified were, were positive were about 29 of those that were HIV negative, which culture did not provide a result. Probably those were results that were culture was saying either contaminated or results were you know error and stuff like that. Um, and the proportion for female performance was as shown as well. Uh, looking at the sensitivity of the smear versus the uh, expert, we, uh, we, we and, 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 and also looking at the LPA, we realized the sensitivity for smear was about 78.6% um, with a positive predictive value of about 117 And um, 
and 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 then npv of about 9.98.4%. So these are the common species that we found prevalent in our part and we are yet to find another study in our country which has done this um, and we hope we will be able to do more to be able to really know for sure what is the actual what is the you know prevalence of all the NTMs that we might be able to put our hands onto. Uh, we we see int uh, intracellular being very common and prevalent among HIV positive, just like it is said in most books. Uh, most researchers find that intracellular. And you know the western part of our country is also an area where HIV is rampant. It the current. Um, national figures of HIV in our country I think it's about 7% but this region is about 15%. So it, it, it ties with, uh, with, the, with the findings that we have. And, and, and we also had an interesting uh, species which we say high, high grade C uh, which belongs to certain species of organisms which resemble or they mimic AFB these are the Nocardia species, the Rhodococcus species, and they will present positivity with AFB uh, microscopy just like, in, like, like an AFB would do. And we could see about a high percentage of those also coming as 16% prevalent within the region. And they're also common in immunocompromised individuals and HIV uh, patients. Very, very uh, uh, interesting. So in summary, we observed NTMs are prevalent in our region and we have shown the common species that we identified and we also see how HIV patients have uh, the specific uh, species that we are. So clinicians would be able to know whether M intracellular as a medication or as a way of management that they could be able to employ to patients who will be presenting um, with this type of uh, species that we may have. Uh, one limitation of our studies, we were not able to use the PCR techniques to be able to identify these species that I'm talking about, I think because of finance and resource limitations. Um, but we, uh, we know and uh, say that it is imperative that for smear results that we receive, whether positive or negative, there's need to always do, an, you know, a I would not say confirmatory testing, but additional testing to be able to identify true positivity or negativity so that patients will be able to be put adequately onto care that they so deserve. Um, and therefore, it's our uh, uh, wish that parallel methodology is very, very useful in MTB diagnosis, and therefore it's very important moving forward. I would like to acknowledge the very, few, the very um, the team that really made this work a success. Um, my institute, Camry, Ministry of Health, who uh, facilities were, you know, providing these uh, samples, and, and CDC, um, uh, who are our funders, and the University of Maryland and in life science for giving us the kit that we used for species identification. We used uh, a common microbacteria kit, the com we call it CM, and the atypical species speciation test kit called AS. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Albert. Uh, Dr. Mgode, may I ask you to come forward? Perhaps, oh, the presenter is Dr. Mulder, I think. Is it? Thank and you very slides. much. My name is Lena Fiebig and I, I joined Apopo only very recently. So I'm actually presenting on behalf on, uh, of Dr. Mgode, our program manager from Tanzania, who unfortunately did not get a visa in time. So sorry for that. Um, yeah, we're very happy that we have a chance to um, present a small set of our operations data. So no research study, but really our operations data on improving the detection of TB in people living with HIV by use of our African giant pouched rats. So as you all may know, the diagnosis of TB is more challenging in people living with HIV, and um, there's a clear need for better tests than um, only sp uh, sputum smear microscopy are still widely used in settings where TB HIV is frequent. Um, we have been using African giant pouched rats since uh, 2007, and in this study, uh, data, or not study, but data set, we want to see um, how the rats actually perform in samples from um, people living with HIV and determine the increase in the TP case detection in this population. 
For those of you who have not seen the reds before, let me just present um, one red. I think it's Angelina Jolie presented here on the right. And uh, this red uh, is an African giant pouch red, as mentioned. And the interesting thing is about, about is it that has it, um, an excellent sense of smell. And it can be trained, and it has a long lifespan. So the in return of investment in training, which takes about nine months, is rather good. And it takes about, or it costs about $1,000 to complete a training of a red, but then only about $1 to have a sample. And the good thing about it is that the red doesn't need more food just beca because of screening more samples. So there's very little running costs, actually, once they, um, the setting is in charge. Um, maybe also an important thing for you to know is that's the cage in which the red does the testing. There are 10 holes, and the red must run over these and will hover over about three seconds um, to indicate that the sample is positive. And there will be always known positives um, where the reds are rewarded on just to keep the red motivated searching for positive um, TB. And um, what is positive TB? Well, the underlying principle is that the reds can smell a set of volatile organic compounds um, and this is, so to say, like the correlate of all of the biomarker that is behind. So just for your understanding, so um, the sample comes to the red. It's not the red that is brought to the clinic and to the patient directly, just because it's slightly more efficient at this moment. What is also very important to know is that the red is not allowed as a single standing or yeah, diagnostic tool. Um, right now, a team of 11 reds has a um, sensitivity of 75%. And the specificity is, in our best accuracy study, slightly lower. Um, so it cannot be used alone. Um, but very much thanks to the National TB and Leprosy Program, we can use it as an additional tool, um, amongst others, in Dar es Salaam, and rescreen all the samples um, that have, gen have been screened by, spear, um, by microscopy in the first place. So you can see a small glimpse from this algorithm here that you will just use the red to rescreen everything, positive and negative samples. And when the red indicates something as positive, we will still not believe the red alone, but reconfirm. In this case, with concentrated smear microscopy, but now, after the study setting, actually increasingly also using gene expert. And then, um, also important to know, there is a strong linkage to care, so the results will be reported back to the governmental system, and we collaborate also to increase like the treatment adherence and bring really the full story to an end. So it's not just about the red, it's like a full service delivery model um, that Apopo has put in place. Uh, just to mention the entire story of retesting the sample is within 24 hours turnaround time. So um, this basically summarizes what, what I've just said. So for this data analysis, we use sputum samples collected in two dot centers, one of them serving people living with HIV. Um, so our tr treatment center and one serving the general population in Dar es Salaam um, from mid-2013 to 2015. The samples were heat, heat and inactivated um, because it doesn't make a difference for the rats and it's just more safe to the rats and to the personnel. Um, the rats are very fast, so they evaluate an average 100 samples within 20 minutes. Um, a lab technician might take like three to four days for the same amount of samples. Um, the DOTS negative samples were always reconfirmed by a WHO-endorsed WHO method, and here in this case, concentrated smear microscopy. And as mentioned, the additional paces, patients, but also every patient, were tracked um, to start treatment. So these are our results, and I would like to draw uh, direct your attention directly to the table. So here you see the first dot center just receiving the general population, of course also receiving some people living with HIV. And this is the second center specialized on people living with HIV. That's the number of people who came by and were evaluated in the time span. This is the number of people right away diagnosed with TB, smear, uh, sputum smear microscopy. That's the total that had been evaluated after using our algorithm. And this is the number of extra found cases. And then the most interesting result is the proportion of additional TB yield by rats, which was 22 in this specific center for the general population, but 160% for the people living with HIV. Then the second part of the results, little surprise, um, the bacilli count in samples from people with living uh, with HIV was much lower in average than among the TB patients of the general population. 
and basically it correlates very well. If you just look at the samples additionally identified by the rats, um, most of them have actually a scanty AFB smear count. So in summary and conclusion, the use of TB detectant rats significantly increases TB detection in people living with HIV where the uh, bacilli count is very low. The dot centers miss mostly cases with this low bacilli count given the use of conventional microscopy. But as we have seen in the beginning, this is the widely used method still in countries with high TB HIV burden. So the use of trained rats enables rapid TB diagnosis in this population and will also help to enhance early TB treatment. Of course, this study shown here doesn't replace like fully paired diagnostic accuracy studies. And I would like to draw your attention on one that will just appear, I think, in the next issue of the Union Journal. Um, where again you can see the sensitivity specificity pairs and the interesting thing is that the sensitivity of 75% uh, seven is basically the same in the people living with HIV than in the um, P um, HIV negative population. Our plans next to just improving um, the diagnostic accuracy in general is um, to explore the opportunity to, to detect a TB using urine samples with the rats and um, we're very, of course, very excited um, about what is this um, to show. At this point, I would like to thank you very much and um, you see that we have a large number of supporters and partners and as you can't see anything, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank especially the National TB and Leprosy Program from Tanzania and the US Optimum Foundation for a lot of support for our initial research on this topic. Thank you so much. Thanks for that nice overview on the, Apopo's work with the, the rats. Well, let's open it up um, for questions. Please um, use the microphone and, and introduce yourself. I'm Elisa Ardizzoni from the Tropical Institute in Antwerp. I work well for MSF uh, also in field conditions, so it's interesting. Just a, a, a question, how much does a, a, a rat and uh, keeping this rat is? Because you have to confirm, I saw that the positivity rate for you is more or less 15%, 20%, if I so correctly. Mm -hmm. So you have still to confirm with expert a very big amount of, of samples. So is it uh, cost effective to keep the rat or uh, compared to just Mm -hmm. doing expert on, on yeah. all. Okay, thank you very much for this question. Unfortunately, this is not published information, but I can uh, tell you that we are working on this, and it's um, like using the red containing algorithm compared to just expert. It's probably not cost-saving, um, but it's also not more expensive, definitely. So somewhere in between. <laughs> Hi, Mark Tuberger from uh, University College London. Um, thank you, that was very interesting. Um, I think I have two key questions. So the first one was, I think the earlier studies that Apopo did with detection of TB in sperm samples, you had to grow the samples in culture, is that right? To begin with, you had to grow the samples in culture first, versus this is direct detection on sputum samples, so, so without culturing it. Is that correct? So um, there might be people uh, in, the r in the room that even know better uh, things about the early phase. It can be that in the beginning uh, cultures has, have been used just to be very clear on what's a positive target. But this is all direct sputum, so no culture involved, sure. except for the diagnostic accuracy studies, of course. Okay, great. For, uh, thanks for clarifying that. And the second question is, how do you standardize a rat? Okay. Isn't, that, isn't that the key question, as in how do you know a rat is malfunctioning with a machine you yeah. get a readout that says, I'm not working? Yeah. Of course, this is a major concern. Um, what I can say is that the rats are never used alone. They're always used in a team. Um, the um, accordance between different rats is very high. The rats have to pass like a graduation initially to be even allowed to go for operations. Otherwise, they will not be used if they don't meet a certain criterion. And there's constant monitoring evaluation, not just of the rat performance, but also of their weight and their health status. If there's any sign that the rat is not doing well, it will just not be considered in the process. So I see that there's concern, but also I think like m other machines, you need calibration and constant monitoring. So I would just think um, 
yeah, you could potentially deal with it. Well, I believe that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Are there more questions from the floor? Whilst Andrew goes to the microphone, can I ask you, out of ignorance, how does the rat indicate that this is a positive or this is a negative yeah. specimen? So right now the rats are trained to stay over the sample um, for at least three seconds and also to put their nose in the, in the hole. And we have also a semi-automated cage where there's infrared measurement to be really sure that it's not human error. We, ha we don't have this for all our operation operations, but we just can use this for research and for adjusting. Um, but of course we have plenty of ideas how we can even improve this and make the sign more clear, like a rat that taps rat and, um, left and right and just, yeah. So there's plenty of ideas how to train the rats even better. Uh, just a quick question. My background is in pediatrics. I'm interested, are you looking at this or have you looked at this or do you plan to in children? Uh, because children are somewhat similar to adults with HIV in that they've got a low bacterial disease. Mm -hmm. So children are included in the data we present. They're not excluded, but it's definitely true that we should just have a very nice analysis uh, specifically for children and in age strata. Thank you. Congratulations for the nice uh, presentation. Uh, are you thinking on the possibility to inbreed uh, rats in order to select uh, some, some trait that has a better yes. sensor? And, and do you know something about uh, current available electronic noses? Mm -hmm. How, are they being tested for, for something similar? So I think the last presentation in this session will be on electronic noses, so I would leave this question to, to the last question. Um, and the first question, I think it's not me the best person to answer. We have a head of research, behavioral research and training, and she believes in personality of rats and just want to explore this issue if some of the rats are better suited for, let's say, for the TB detection or for the landmine detection, which we also do as an organization. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So thank you. It generates a lot of discussion when we have um, talks um, about the, the performance of these rats. But uh, the greatest challenge uh, is the, the standardization and, and how can you possibly quality assure uh, an, an animal? And, um, and, and how, as WHO, would we be able to recommend um, you know, rats as a diagnostic um, device? It's, uh, it, Sure, you know, you know, VOCs clearly you know, are mm. a, uh, an important way of, of diagnosing TB and the rats clearly are showing some benefit, but I'm, I'm not sure we're completely there. But thank you. Yeah, uh, working much. on it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Moving on to our next presentation uh, from Gloria, Gloria Porto Castro. Okay, um, the, the next one then, uh, from Nyanda, <coughs> from Tanzania. Okay, uh, Nyanda will be presenting on molecular bacterial load assay as a marker for treatment response late during treatment. So, um, welcome. Yeah. Uh, uh. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks, uh, Christoph and, and uh, Rita, for moderating. I also want to appreciate the, the Union Conference for uh, giving us an opportunity to present about this work. Uh, before I present, I just want to acknowledge in the midst of us our Chief Medical Officer, Professor Bakari, who is also my, uh, my lecturer and a trainer at the university, also the TB program, my supervisor at the University of Munich, Dr. Henrik, and colleagues around. I just want to welcome you on board as I take you through a molecular bacterial load assay uh, as a marker for treatment response uh, late during uh, treatment. On behalf of my colleagues ranging from the University of St. Andrews, uh, University of Munich, in t but also colleagues in Tanzania, uh, thank you very much for coming up. Uh, definitely tools that can assist us to understand whether a patient is cured or perhaps uh, give you an opportunity to uh, terminate treatment are urgently needed uh, for various reasons. Number one, we wish to individualize treatment as opposed to put tre I mean, 
patient on treatment, say for six months, all the way perhaps to two years, depending whether the drug sensitive or my drug resistant uh, treatment. Trials so far have shown that uh, uh, most of patients are cured with a short regimen of four months. Uh, as a population of individuals perhaps may require extension due to data that they have shown that they can uh, pick up relapse. And as you can see with these uh, arrows, we don't know yet and we don't have a tool that can really tell us whether uh, an individual can end up at four months, uh, at six months, seven months or more uh, because of the uh, challenge that are being faced. But also reason number two, why do we need a, 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 I mean a, <coughs> a tool that can help us to monitor treatment is also can be used in drug development, uh, especially when we are looking forward for uh, uh, something like a culture which has contamination that can affect the end point, but also the cost that can be associated with longer uh, waiting for uh, an end point. And the, the current tools are having challenges uh, from the radiography, which is actually we know that it's not specific. In some places in developing countries also they use uh, clinical uh, symptomatology, which also are quite unspecific. The smear microscope has a lot of challenges that we know uh, coming to catch up with is a gold standard. I can say it's imperfect because it is uh, faced with a lot of contamination, but also colleague has, uh, Andrew, you presented about the contamination, the challenge that can be around. Although its availability is also uh, uh, an issue, especially in high TB burden countries, the need for safety by containment is also, it comes in in this regard. The, the famous DNA detection that we are having as point of care test, I mean, not point of care at the moment, but like the gene expert, uh, can still peak, uh, I mean, positivity even six months after treatment. That way can, they can not, not tell us in real time. Some have done some uh, messenger RNA that actually, however, these are too rapid. They are in s uh, small quantities and are, are quite unstable. And the, so far, uh, through the uh, Panacea Biomarker Expansion Program, uh, we have been evaluating a new diagnostic tools that is catcher free, it's a ribosomal RNA based method, this is fully quantitative. Uh, from the sample that you can, they can be reached at the laboratory, it can give results in, in four hours, and actually it's uh, quite stable and it's available in large quantities. And then you can see the decline of the of, of, of the RNA uh, ribosomal across the treatment uh, of, the, of an individual right from the baseline uh, to the very end. So it gives uh, allowance to, to, to measure treatment response in, in real time. Uh, the, so therefore the object was to evaluate, this is a molecular bacterial load assay, uh, in short MBLA, uh, as a monitoring tool for treatment response. And the study was restricted in two sites in Tanzania, Kilimanjaro, uh, and also Mbea, where I come from, just bordering Malawi and Zambia. This is a map of Tanzania. And this uh, was nested within the, uh, the, the, the Panacea MAMS trial, and also uh, that actually gave data set to the uh, Panacea Biomarker ex Expansion Program that is led by Professor Grips of St. Andrews. Uh, more information are published uh, by Bure and uh, Henrik uh, last year in The Lancet. Uh, just to give you a, a, a glimpse of, uh, of our results, so what you see here, uh, actually, actually one third of the samples that we evaluated uh, were uh, contamination. Therefore, contamination is really a problem of about 38%, uh, you saw I think around 36% in these uh, samples. And the, what you see here, while Mijitu was giving, the liquid culture was giving us uh, up to 42 contamination. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, it was contaminated, therefore no results available to give a clinician or a, a clinical trialist. Uh, the MBLA was able to pick 42% of those which were contaminated. Another message from here, those which were already negative, that means a liquid culture will declare this uh, not, not having a, a, a disease. See, 36% were positive on the MBLA assay. And in, uh, on a small margin, that is 80% uh, of those which are uh, positive on liquid were negative on MBLA assay. 
So we wait further to compare and the difference were statistically significant. Therefore, in, from this also the message that uh, the MBL assay overcomes contamination because it's not affected by contamination as opposed to culture. Uh, again, if you compare, the, looking at the qualitative results, uh, 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 from baseline to month six, you see that at the end of treatment, we still see 1.27, almost 2% of, uh, of sample that we uh, analyzed where had, had catcher positivity. As we all know that uh, uh, as treatment progresses, also contamination do rises. So we see also here that from rising from 2% to 53%, uh, which is also posing a challenge in terms of at the time when you want to have the, the information available for a clinician to make a clinical decision whether to stop a medication or to declare this patient is, uh, is, is cured, also you see that there is a rising trend of uh, contamination. However, we're looking at the MBL assay qualitative uh, 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 data, you see that uh, at the end of treatment, as opposed to almost 2% for the liquid culture, we had about 20% uh, were still uh, positive. So they were more positive uh, by uh, the MBL assay as opposed to, to culture. And the, uh, this slide also uh, brings in, uh, this is uh, the red uh, is MBL assay, the, the bluish one is uh, liquid uh, culture, and, the, so, and the, the green one is solid. You see, of course, at baseline, both liquid and MBL were, I mean, it picked up, they were all positive, uh, the samples from baseline, but actually 25% uh, of solid declared negative. If you see that the trend were almost similar uh, until week, uh, week 12, uh, then you see that uh, a, a li liquid culture started to declare more patient or samples were uh, not having Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and you see that this, uh, this is 1.2 for the solid, 1.7 for, uh, for, for the liquid, and then about 20% uh, for, 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 for the MBL assay. Interesting, last year, Malibu uh, showed that uh, almost 35% of uh, culture negative sputum samples at month six had messenger RNA. So this, as we have found about uh, uh, 20, almost 20%. 20 so still you can see there some activity and we know that RNA is a measure of live mycobacterium or live activity. Uh, so to conclude, uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, with, with the molecular bacterial load assay, there are no missing data due to contamination as opposed to culture-based methods. Uh, it can be used, it can be done in, in uh, developing countries like Tanzania, and so far we were not, uh, there was no any assay inhibition. Uh, seeing molecular load as a molecular bacterial load assay that are able to see results until the very end, it allows us actually to consistently follow through and give us uh, similar results in terms of how long you can continue following up patients. However, these results are quite encouraging for further studies in order to increase the number of patients uh, to evaluate clinical outcomes. This is the first study that we are looked up to month six, so we don't have results that actually can look, what does it mean with 20%? Are these, uh, could they relapse, perhaps in, if we follow them? This is our next step that we are planning to do, including the, the cost-effective plans. However, uh, the study can also, the, the MBLS can be also be used in, uh, in, in defining treatment response and the endpoints in clinical trials, as I mentioned, with free uh, from contamination. So I just want to appreciate study participants, my supervisors, because this was part of my PhD, uh, Dr. Henrik, who is in the midst of us, uh, uh, the study teams, uh, as well as the University of St. Andrews, our funders, the EDCDP, and other uh, collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tinginia. Are there any questions from the floor? Could you please, Albert, come to the microphone? Any other questions? We are sort of about to start running out of time, so if there are any other persons wishing to ask questions, just line yourselves behind Albert. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. My concern is uh, about contamination. Mm. Um, and the strength of your work basically is to show uh, how this new assay reduces or minimizes contamination. But to, for me, it fails to bring out 
the factors uh, that you consider as, as agents of contamination that the culture result culture testing technique has uh, what 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 were those th things that you considered contrib contribute to cal uh, to contamination that the mbl was able not to to take away and 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 also uh, as somebody who has um, uh, also experienced contamination challenges from 40% to right now what WHO considers as 8%, which is the standard, uh, what are some of the things that you know contribute towards contamination that should, your, your, your work should show us to help us, those who are struggling with 15%, like you said, to bring it to WHO expected of under 8% for liquid culture. So I think that is missing from your paper because we want to really want to find out if you're looking at contamination, what were these thank key areas you're you, looking Ante. at? Thank yeah, you. Thank let, you. Let, let, sorry for cutting you off a little bit, but it's just about the time. Let, let us uh, give you a chance to respond. Thank you, Albert. Uh, <coughs> uh, what you are asking is out of the scope of this uh, presentation because we are looking at the molecular load assay as a measure of treatment response. Uh, this is quite specific to the, six, to the mycobacterium tuberculosis, so we are not evaluating uh, what are the causes for the contamination uh, in the lab or so. I think we can have a broader discussion, but this actually, we are looking into the context that actually it's quite specific, uh, not affected by contamination as culture. Okay, I think we will ask the two of you to compare notes uh, regarding the contamination let, let discuss, issue. Let's uh, discuss after the, the end Thank of you. this presentation. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank mm. you. Yeah. And this session's last presentation, portable electronic nose as a potential point of care screening device. Over to you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. As, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the about, uh, portable electronic nose as a potential screening device for pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, I think uh, the background has uh, sort of already uh, laid out in the previous presentations. Uh, basically, we have uh, a need for alternative diagnostics methods because the current standard uh, methods, as uh, spoon and smear uh, culture, they have their own limitations, such as contamination. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, time limitations uh, regarding the culture uh, results and uh, uh, about sputum smear it has uh, uh, its downsides as well because it's uh, operator dependent it needs uh, training and uh, this might not be a problem in uh, in uh, specific labs in uh, high experience labs but it might be a problem in uh, rural settings or underserved areas um, so um we focus uh, our study in the analysis of uh, volatile uh, organic compounds, uh, as uh, other study already talk about it. And uh, these are basically present in the exhale breath of uh, patients uh, with uh, tuberculosis, which analyzed as a whole could be a potential biomarker for diagnostic uh, uh, in, in, in this disease. So, uh, uh, this is uh, the bolotic uh, organic compounds has been previously studied basically in uh, gas chromatography. Uh, but as you can uh, uh, understand, these uh, devices are very expensive, are difficult to analyze, and uh, are difficult to interpret the, the results. Also, uh, several other studies uh, involving animals, such as uh, the rats, uh, which is a study previously presented, and also uh, bees, uh, honeybees, uh, has also been tested for, for discriminating between TB and uh, non-TB patients. Uh, so uh, we basically focus on uh, electronic nose, which is no other thing than um, machine learning device, uh, which uh, discriminate between uh, uh, patients uh, uh, with different conditions. Uh, this device was developed by a, uh, a team in Netherlands, uh, in Zutphen, uh, the Inos team. Uh, basically, this device is a portable, battery-operated, very easy to use, handheld device, such as in this uh, really nice cartoon. Uh, basically, uh, the patient needs to uh, breathe through the device for five minutes, in and out, uh, while wearing a nose clamp, uh, to guarantee, uh, uh, to um, uh, secure the, this is a vocal respiration. Uh, after that, the sample is processed for 10 minutes. Uh, I don't know why this is, 
automatically being passed. Um, the samples is processed uh, for 10 minutes, uh, and after that, uh, you upload the results into a server, which has a pattern recognition system based on neural network analysis, uh, which I'm, I will not go into details about this because uh, it's uh, time constraints. Uh, well, basically, very briefly, uh, inside the device, it has three metal oxide sensors, which sensor the, the, the flow or the exhale breath, which have the compounds. And uh, this device is uh, thermocycling constantly at least 36 times per each measurement. And the output or the data matrix of each measurement is a function of uh, the type of sensor. Uh, each uh, individual sensor has different catalysts. And uh, the compounds inside the, the, the gas of uh, the patient. And the temperature, of course, that it's uh, uh, on cycling in the, in the device constantly. So, uh, well, in this very nice picture, you can see that it's a very handheld device. It's easy to operate, and you see that uh, uh, this colleague of us is wearing the nose clamp. Uh, so, the aims of the study were to determine the accuracy of the electronic nose device for uh, for the diagnosis of pulmonary TB and compare it with the diagnostic yield. Uh, in this time, I'm just going to present the comparison between the spurin smear, not single, and uh, double spurin smear. Um, so basically, our inclusion criteria were subjects older than 15 years old, people who classify as symptomatic respiratory, HIV, and uh, diabetes mellitus uh, negative. And exclusion criteria, very importantly, we exclude all patients that uh, uh, were in, uh, or initiate uh, TB drug treatment, and uh, of those were, who were not capable to excel through the ENOS device during the procedure, and uh, those who, who had HIV status unknown. Uh, all the patients uh, underwent uh, medical history and physical examination, microbiological studies, of course, HIV testing, chest x-ray, and ENOS uh, test. Uh, we screened for 226 patients. Of those, uh, 40 were excluded, uh, giving us uh, 186 patients enrolled. Of those, 86 were confirmed pulmonary TB, defined as a positive culture, regardless of the result of the spirin smear. So that gives us uh, 77 patients with a positive uh, um, smear, also positive culture, of course, and negative smear patients are around nine patients. And we have three different uh, control groups, lung cancer, pulmonary infections, not TB, of course, uh, and healthy controls. And uh, some a uh, little bit uh, briefly about the baseline characteristics, uh, mean age for the TB and uh, 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 other bacterial infections in lung cancer was uh, 42, although uh, lung cancer was a little bit higher, uh, was uh, mostly uh, male samples, 60 to 40 percent, and there were no statistical significance between BMI, and uh, it was roughly about 10 percent of uh, ever smoker patients between the TB and uh, a little bit higher in lung cancer as suspected. Uh, so, well, in terms of results, uh, in this uh, plot, in this box plot, you can see in the y-axis uh, a scale from minus one to one, which is basically the output of the of the neural network analysis, and you can see a, a very good differentiation between the uh, the red, which is the non-TV cases, and the uh, blue, which is the TV cases, and it's a statistical significance, and the interquantum range are not even overlapping, which is good. Uh, furthermore, when we uh, stratify the uh, between the groups already. Uh, uh, I, I already introduced uh, a few slides ago. Uh, we see that uh, TV cases, which is the blue and the smear negative, are uh, still statistically significant between the healthy controls, pulmonary infections, and lung cancer, especially. And interestingly enough, although we don't have enough power to prove that, to prove this, is that. Uh, Smear negative cases uh, didn't show uh, statistical significance with the uh, uh, smear positive cases. After that, we performed an ROC curve uh, to analyze the diagnostic yield and compare between the ENOS device, which is the blue line with a blue fill, the air blue area, which is below that uh, blue line, uh, the red line, which represents uh, the double spurin smears. Uh, and the green line, which represents a single spoon smear. Uh, so based uh, on the table below and also the ROC curve, you can tell that there's a significantly higher uh, area on the curve uh, for uh, ENOS compared with a single spoon smear. 
and the uh, sensitivity was 86%, uh, which was significantly higher than the 56% for a single spoon smear and 79% for a two spoon and smear. Uh, we can say that for the two double spoon and smear was not uh, inferior at least. And the negative predicted value was far greater for a single spoon and smear and, two, and double spoon and smear. So um, a little bit about uh, tell you the rationale behind analyzing single and two spoon and smears is because uh, every time that the patient needs to go to the lab, it represents time for the patient. Also, it represents uh, reagents in the lab, time for the technician. And uh, as we know, the standard is uh, uh, at least two spoon and smears. Uh, and this is uh, significantly uh, enough uh, time, at least three days, and uh, three uh, days that the patient needs to visit the lab in comparison with the ENOS, uh, which uh, gives you results in about uh, 20 minutes, and uh, the patient only needs to come once to, 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 to the facility. Uh, so we can conclude that this uh, device has a good diagnostic yield and uh, so far superior that a single spoon and smear and the sensitivity was not inferior to the results of two combined spearmen, two uh, combined spoon and smears. However, uh, the times uh, that takes to uh, uh, have the results, the, 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 the time back to the results for the ENOS device is significantly uh, uh, better than the two spoon and smears. And in its actual design, uh, of course, uh, as, uh, we don't uh, recommend this as a, on a single study to diagnose uh, TV, but we think it's a really good tool to screen for TV in uh, rural or underserved areas that lack uh, of uh, experience or trained uh, um, operators or technicians and uh, lack of, uh, of lab facilities or reagents. And uh, this could uh, open up uh, 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 or identify subjects that need further assessments. We have time for a, f a few questions. Uh, Stella, oh, please, yeah, come. And then Stella. Great, Mark Zabrugger from UCL. Um, very interesting study, thank you very much. There's um, obviously been quite a lot of work previously on um, using gas chromatography. This is where the kind of data initially came from, from VOCs, mainly from New Zealand. And then subsequent studies that have tried to use ENOS. So, so in a way, your because every ENOS is different. And I think that's important to point out. So the performance characteristics are different, and they're related to the number of sensors you have in the machine. And this machine only has three sensors, so it doesn't give you a very broad spectrum of of responses that you can detect. Um, I think the key limitation looking at your data is when you look at the specificity, that the specificity is 74%, so that means you would falsely detect or falsely diagnose somebody with TB who then needs to go to a secondary referral hospital or to a tertiary referral hospital, travel long distances in kind of low resource areas to have TB ruled out. How, how do you think you can overcome that? Do you think, it, is there, are there plans to further develop this instrument or? Uh, well, um it's a really good question, and uh, that this is why uh, we, we we understand that the specificity is not great for this device. So that's why we recommend uh, say uh, use. It's a useful tool for screening. So uh, uh, which uh, well uh, with a screening uh, with these numbers around eighty six percent, there's a, a, a very uh, low. Uh, uh, false uh, negative detection. So, of course, after this, uh, this, screening, uh, this screening step with the Enos device, it opens up uh, further assessments like culture, of course, and uh, uh, maybe gene expert, as uh, other studies have suggested. Uh, and um, I think uh, it's, uh, yeah, I think this is, this is the basic recommendation that we, that we, that we are uh, that we can uh, uh, collect from from the results of this study, and uh, as you said, uh, there are different versions of the Enos, and I think it's really important to pinpoint that uh, this uh, module it's specifically trained for population in Venezuela, which is the country I'm from, okay. and uh, so uh, we haven't got results between comparison between different. Uh, uh, populations uh, from different countries, let's say, but we uh, kind of expect that it might have a, lit, uh, a, a little bit difference because it, it all depends uh, uh, around uh, metabolomics and, uh, and uh, so this can highly variable between populations. Great, thank you very much.
Thank you for the question. Thank you very much for this highly interesting study. So my burning question is, do you have any preliminary results on sputum smear negative patients? Uh, yes, uh, although uh, it's, uh, w w I, I think we are running on uh, low power because of a small sample, but uh, uh, I think we showed that there's, uh, there's no uh, an, a relative difference between, uh, I think it is, uh, between the smear positive and smear negative okay. results. So um, these smear negative results are basically from patients that receive uh, 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 antibiotic treatment before the diagnosis of TB. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, I think this is, uh, even though it's a little, a little sample, we are for them working for mm -hmm. increasing this. I think this is, could be promising. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have also worked with the uh, HIV, uh, which is kind of also uh, palsy vasular uh, mm -hmm. disease. And uh, we don't have the results for, for now, but the, the results mm -hmm. are also very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last questions. Thank you. My name is Stella van Beers. Nice I was from the Royal Tropic Institute and the Department uh, TB Research. And actually, we worked on ENOS a couple of years ago. And we had beautiful results. And we could separate TB, non-TB, etc., etc. But then came the point, and now we failed, and I hope you manage, is that we, we can separate it using statistical analysis. But if we took a random sample and wanted to predict whether it had TB or not TB, everything fell flat. So there are two ways of the analysis. The, what is it, to get a, uh, the, the breakdowns, but to use, have one unknown sample to predict whether it has TB is a different matter. Is that your experience as well? Yes, uh, this is a great question, actually, because uh, before, um, we, we, this is a collab collaborative effort between us in the uh, Netherlands, and the team in the Netherlands suggested us to, before going to prospective study, uh, we develop a robust uh, data set uh, with, a, with, with a model to then, based on that model, uh, and uh, be, because this model is what uh, uh, learns, uh, the, the machine learns from, and um, based on this model, uh, the prospective analysis is, 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 is going to be done. So you will go. Yes, do yes, it. We, we, we will perform pro yeah. uh, uh, the, these studies as a prospective, uh, uh, as a prospective study, uh, which is a complete lead line from for the device. Well, we don't have the results right now, though. Okay, thank you. Okay, th thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much.